in Matthew 23, verses 1 to 12. So I'll give you some time to turn to Matthew 23, verses 1 to 12. Again, sorry about the, the PowerPoints. It also actually, because we were having technical difficulties that I was trying to figure out, I didn't actually get to practice my sermon a second time over, so I've only gone through it one time. So uh, if I'm more glued to the text than I am to eye contact, that's probably why. Um, but hopefully uh, it still goes well with what I say, but I'll pray about that anyway. Uh, but this week, we are preparing ourselves to get into the seven woes of the Pharisees. That's what we're going to go through next week. But this week is where Jesus lays the groundwork to begin with those woes. He sets up the groundwork of this is what the Pharisees are doing, and it's wrong, as well as this is what you, the crowd, and my disciples should be doing. So let's read what Jesus has to say in, again, Matthew 23, verses 1 to 12. It says, Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, so do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do. For they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by others. For they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. And they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi. For you have one teacher and you are all brothers. And call no man your father on earth. For you have one Father who is in heaven. Neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Christ. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity and this privilege to share your word and your message. And I just pray that you would be with me as I share it in the name of Jesus. Give me clarity of mind and clarity of vision as well as I preach. Um, if I say anything that might be wrong or untrue, I pray that that would not be believed in the name of Jesus. I do not want to lead anybody astray, but I pray that your truths would be believed in the name of Jesus and they would be understood in the name of Jesus. And they would be remembered in the name of Jesus. Give us all understanding of your truths, of your word in this time in the name of Jesus. Be at work in each one of our hearts in the name of Jesus and bless this time and help it to be a time that is, of course, honoring and glorifying to you. Even in this time, we can praise you. We can praise you when we sing, but we can also praise you in our hearts as we hear truths that line up with Scripture. And we know that it's true. So help us to praise you even in the midst of this time, Lord. And again, challenge us where we might need to be challenged, but also encourage us where we need to be encouraged. Thank you, Lord, that you are the one who is all-knowing, the one who knows exactly what you're doing. And again, be glorified in this time. In the name of Jesus, amen. What is a hypocrite? And I'm going to do something a little different. I'm going to give you a little bit of multiple-choice answers here. So, what is a hypocrite? Is it A, a giant plump, hungry animal that likes to swim and has insanely big teeth that usually look like they need to be brushed? Is it B, a person who is bouncing off the walls after eating a ton of the candy that he's supposed to be reviewing? Or is it C, an actor? An actor. What is it? Let me know. Ah, that's pretty good, that's pretty good. C, yes, of course. It's not a hippopotamus, right? It's not a hypercritic. It's an actor. 
It's an actor. The word hypocrite originates from the Greek word uh, hypocrites, and it was a word that was talking about actors that wore masks to pro- portray different emotions. So you have the, the happy mask, and you have the sad mask, and you have the angry mask, you might have a, a surprise mask, and so on and so forth. But they were all sorts of masks, right? They were as- actors that wore all sorts of masks to cover their true face. Now, when we think of actors today, we don't usually think of, I guess actors do wear masks here and there, but we don't usually think of them as wearing masks. They're people still, though, that play a specific role, right? They could be playing uh, like a killer or something like that, but in real life, they're not a killer, right? They're just acting. In a movie, they could be playing someone from a different religion as well, like maybe they're playing a, a reverend, and part of their role is to give a sermon. But in real life, they might not believe anything that they just said up on the pulpit, right? Because they were acting. That's kind of how we see hypocrites today, but it's just that when we think of hypocrites, it's not actually someone acting, it's them in real life, right? It's someone who says their piece in real life, but also in real life acts in a way that goes against what they said before. So going through the woes next week, we'll be seeing that in six out of seven of those woes, Jesus calls the scribes and Pharisees hypocrites. Right? He calls them hypocrite, 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 like all over this chapter when we get into it next week. But he doesn't directly call them hypocrites in today's actual verses. We don't see the word hypocrite there. However, he is beginning to still establish the idea that they are hypocrites. We even see in there, for they preach, but do not practice. And of course, that's not talking about what I did today, how I wasn't able to practice my sermon a second time. No, it's they don't practice the words they're saying. They don't act upon. They don't live their lives according to what they are preaching you should live your life by, right? They preach, but they do not practice. You might have heard the saying, Do as I say, not as I do, right? Do as I say, not as I do, which is a saying that in a lot of cases may be an indicator of someone being a hypocrite. Now, there are cases where this saying, do as I say, not as I do, is not hypocritical, right? Like if you've got your onion chopping knife and your three-year-old says, I want to hold that knife and you tell them they're not allowed to, and they insist by saying, but you're doing it, you're holding it, right? Obviously that's a do as I say, not as I do situation that makes sense. Same thing if we were to end up in like a restricted area, if we snuck into a restricted area, an area that we were not supposed to be in, and we run into a security guard who says, hey, you can't be here. We might be so bold as to, you know, attempt the comeback of, well, you're here, but obviously the guard has a permission to be there that you do not, making that a do as I say, not as I do situation that, again, is not hypocritical. It's the same way with God. God has a right as the creator of everything that exists, as the one who gives life to everyone and everything alive, to take that life away. God has the right to decide who lives and who dies. And we see him exercise that right many times in the Old Testament, especially. We've also seen him give that right to certain Old Testament figures as well, However, as humans in general, we do not have that same right to decide who lives and who dies, right? If we take someone's life, we have transgressed, of course, against that person, but also against God himself because he has not given us that right. He's not given us that right. However, again, God taking a life does not make him a hypocrite. Again, he's the one who created life in the first place. And it's nice to know also that he has infinite and perfect wisdom, right, as well. Whether we like his decisions or we don't, he still makes the right decisions. 
So there are ways in which do as I say, not as I do can work non-hypocritically. But let's say another situation. Let's say there's a parent who's trying to teach his children not to be rude and not to fight with each other and not to be mean to each other. Yet he yells at his wife or is really rude to his wife. Now, the right thing to do would be for him to truly apologize to his wife and also apologize to his children and admit to them, hey, dad was wrong. My dad should not have done that. But maybe instead of doing that right thing, he instead says, I'm the leader of this home. I can yell at my wife. I can be rude if I want to. I can disrespect her. I'm the one in charge. I'm justified in doing that. That, to the children he's trying to teach, is again, like saying, do as I say, not as I do. And of course, that situation is so very hypocritical and very wrong. Like, everyone is a sinner, right? Everyone's a sinner. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. If you think of the most godly person you've ever met or ever seen on TV or anything like that, they're a sinner, right? They're a sinner. Now, if we are in Christ, we're no longer identified as sinners. We're rather counted as saints, but we still sin, right? We still fall short. We still mess up. We're not perfect while we're here in the flesh. And so there are times where we tell other people to do according to the Bible what's written there while we ourselves are not actually doing what's according to the Bible. However, if we acknowledge our wrongdoing, if we have a heart of repentance in that regard, that's different from what we see the Pharisees do. Because the Pharisees in their heart and in their mind are justifying their actions that are contrary to the scriptures, right? The hypocrite justifies their do as I say, not as I do, while what they do is wrongdoing. The Pharisees are saying, you know, obey the law of Moses, obey the law of Moses. And they were right to do that because the Jews of Jesus's day were supposed to obey the law of Moses. Now, of course, today we don't have to obey that law necessarily, right? Not the old Mosaic law. We're not under that law. But back then, the Pharisees were rightly saying, obey that law of Moses. Obey the law of Moses while wrongly disobeying that same law that they were preaching. And they were also justifying their breach of that law. So you see the hypocrisy there, right? And this is made extremely clear by Jesus when he talks to them about one of the Ten Commandments, which is honor your father and your mother. Back in Matthew 15, Jesus says, For God commanded, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if anyone tells his father or his mother what you would have gained from me is given to God, he need not honor his father. So for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. So what these Pharisees were doing is they were making an exception to that rule of honor your father and your mother. They were like, you don't have to follow this rule if you say what you would have gained from me is Corbin or is given to God. You don't have to help your parents out if you say it's for God. And Jesus calls them out for that, right? He's saying, that's dishonoring your father and mother. That's breaking that commandment. You're literally breaking the commandment of God in order to establish the tradition of man or to further the tradition of man. So that's an example of how the Pharisees justify breaking the law of Moses. It's more important to give to God so you're doing a better thing if you withhold your, say, money from your parents and instead give it to God, right? You don't have to help them out as they age because God is more important than your parents. God is a more important person to honor. But the thing is, of course, like, you're literally dishonoring the person that you're supposed to honor when you dishonor your parents because that's what he's told you to do, right? The Pharisees have their ways of justifying their teaching, 
But in the process, they're still breaching the law of Moses. They're breaking it. And this behavior is all over. We see it all over the Gospels, how they break their laws, right? For instance, a lot of times when you see the Pharisees, one thing that you constantly see is that they seem to have no love for most people, right? Which is in breach of the second great commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. In fact, it's actually even a breach of the first, because if you're disobeying any commandment, as a Jew, it shows you're not loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And the hypocrisy shows when they try to justify that breach or say, oh, that's actually not a breach of the law. I'm not breaking the law. It's okay if we do that. It's okay if we do that. That shows their hypocrisy so clearly. If we look back at today's text in verse 1, we're told that Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, so do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works that they do. So the scribes and the Pharisees sat on Moses' seat, and as the Sanhedrin, they were judges over the Jewish people as Moses was their judge in the past. They were an authority that was supposed to be respected, but again, not imitated. Similar to maybe our governing authorities today. A lot of political leaders are not people that we want to imitate. In fact, a lot of them have hypocrisy of their own. We might think of some of the leaks that got out a while back where at the height of the pandemic, people were going on vacations while they were saying, don't go on vacations, right? It was like, nobody travel anywhere right now, but I'm going to Cuba, right? A lot of political leaders are not people that we want to imitate, but as long as they are our governing authorities, we need to respect them and the rules that they impose unless, of course, they compromise God's commands to us in the Bible, right? And I think the idea that Jesus is trying to get across is similar. Obviously, if what the Pharisees are commanding compromises the actual law of Moses that they're under, then Jesus doesn't want them to do that. He doesn't want them to compromise that, right? If, if they're saying that Corbin excuse is okay, right? You don't have to honor your father and mother if this is the case, then of course Jesus doesn't want them to, he doesn't want them to, you know, cling to that teaching. He doesn't want them to follow that teaching. Although, even in that case, that was to the Pharisees an optional thing. It, it said, if anyone tells his father or mother, what you have gained from me is given to God, he need not honor his father, need not honor his father. So it's not like they prohibited the Jews from honoring their parents. They just made a way to avoid it if they didn't want to. So Jesus isn't calling them to obey the Pharisees and the people in the seat of Moses, the Sanhedrin. He's not calling them to obey their suggestions but he is calling them to obey their laws. First of all, because a lot of those laws do come from God through Moses, but also because the scribes and the Pharisees are the authority that God has set over them. Although, of course, there's also the Romans as well who are ruling at this time. But again, it's do and observe whatever they, the scribes and the Pharisees, tell you, but not the works that they do. For they preach, but do not practice. A lot of their teaching is sound, but don't imitate them because their works are not sound. They're awful. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. They didn't actually care about people or, or love people, right? They added burden after burden. A extra law upon extra law as well. They added far more laws than the ones that God had actually given through Moses. And when people struggled with the burden of keeping those laws, it wasn't, oh, let's help them out. It was either leave them on their own or just tear them down for not obeying. Tear them down. The only time they really helped anyone 
was to look good in the eyes of people. One of the things also that the chief priests did, who would have actually been Sadducees, not Pharisees, the chief priests, but they were still in the Sanhedrin. They were still judges in that sense. And we talked about this a couple months ago, but what they did was they increased the price of animals so that the poor could barely afford them. And maybe the poor couldn't even afford them, right? And this was possible because if the people had an animal that was not bought from one of the chief priest's franchises, he'd have that animal or some of his priests would have that animal deemed unacceptable for sacrifice. So there were so many unnecessary and cruel burdens that the Jewish leaders, like the people on the seat of Moses in Jesus' day, put on people. Right? They put so many unnecessary burdens just for their own greed and their own gain. And again, they themselves were not willing to move those burdens with even their finger. Because for them, that's how easy it would have been. With their finger, they could have moved that. They could have made things easier. They could have lifted people's burdens, but they didn't care. They didn't love. They do all their deeds to be seen by others. That's where their heart is, right? It's not in caring for people. It's not in loving people. It's in, I want people to see how good I am. It's just like we see during the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says in Matthew 6, I'll read it for you. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do, there's that word hypocrites, in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. And then if we go back to, down to the verse 5 in Matthew chapter 6, so we're still in Matthew chapter 6, so I'll still read it for you here. Jesus is still continuing with the same theme. He just talks about prayer this time, right? It says, and when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. The hypocrites have received their reward. The only reward they're getting, which is man's praise. Not God's praise, which is the praise that matters, right? Going back to chapter 23, verse 5, our passage today. Like we've mentioned, it says they do all their deeds to be seen by others. For they make their phylacteries... And that's a very big word, phylacteries. What is that? I did have a picture. It's not up here, so I'll just describe it to you. It's like this box that they wore on their forehead, kind of like a little, you know, just a little box. And they had scriptures. It was made out of leather. And they had specific scriptures from Exodus and Deuteronomy inside of those boxes. And what they would do is the Jews would customarily wear those during morning prayer. But what the Pharisees would do is they would usually wear them much more often than just morning prayer. And of course, they made them more broad. And this was to try and show that basically, like they were more spiritual, right? It was supposed to build them up in looking like they were godly. So it says they made their phylacteries broad and then their fringes, or corners of their garment, which would have had tassels on them, they make those long. So they make their phylacteries broad, and their fringes long. And again, it's because they want to be seen. They want to stand out in the eyes of people. They want to stand out as better than other people. And, of course, they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. They loved hearing that title. Rabbi. Rabbi. They loved it. A modern day equivalent of that could be how people are called like doctor, as in someone who has their doctorate, right? Because doctor is not just for medical doctors. It could be even someone who is a biblical scholar or a theologian. Like, 
You'll see that some pastors out there might even have their doctorate, so they're called doctor, and then it's their name, right? Doctor this, doctor that, right? Even a pastor could have that title. Now, the word rabbi itself does not necessarily mean doctor because, of course, that would be assuming the medical doctor, but it means teacher, right? Which a lot of people with the doctorate are. They're teachers. But this word is used in such a way that it can mean, just like doctor, I'm an expert in my field. Listen to me. I'm a doctor. Or I'm rabbi. I'm rabbi. Right? I'm an expert. Listen to me. Which doesn't always have to be abused, but these Pharisees, of course, abused that big time, right? These Pharisees just let that title, Rabbi, really, really get right to their heads. I am a big deal. Oh, I love it when people call me Rabbi. And so Jesus tells his Jewish audience something pretty interesting in verse 8. And this is kind of a little bit of the, the interesting part of the text, like, hmm, like, Am I doing something wrong here if I'm reading this text and I've been doing this my whole life? So, so let's look at it. Jesus says, But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. So he's basically saying, you are all equal, right? Spiritually, you are all equal. You're brothers. Don't let a title get in the way of that. In fact, again, don't even get people to call you rabbi. But then it gets more interesting, right? And call no man your father. Call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Now, does that mean we can't call our biological dads, or even like not biological, right? Even just our father figures, because a lot of the time who we call father is not necessarily biological. But can we not call people father? Can we not call those people in our lives father? I think we can, right? And so I'll, I'll just kind of get to that. I think we can call them that. I think that this context is using father in a similar sense as rabbi, or in a similar sense as what it says in the next verse, neither be called instructors, which is not instructor as teacher would be, because we've talked about teachers, but instructor as in one who instructs people to do something, which would make the word that fits very well, leader, right? Leader. So neither be called instructors, leaders, for you have one leader, one instructor, the Christ. So again, interesting. Let me try and explain all of this from a point of view of me being the pastor. Because that's my role here. And a lot of you, you call me that, right? Pastor John. And that's fine. That makes sense. But I want to say too, like, I'm better than no one, right? I'm your brother in Christ. That's who I am. I am your brother in Christ. I'm not your rabbi in Christ. I'm not your father in Christ. I'm not your leader in Christ. Now, do I have a leadership role here? Yes. Am I, in that sense, your spiritual leader? Yeah, but really I'm almost like a puppet leader because I want to be pointing you to the true leader, which is Christ. Um, and also, am I a leader who is in Christ? Yes, I am in Christ, but I'm not your leader in Christ in any sense that elevates me above you, right? I'm your equal still. I'm your equal. I'm your brother in Christ. If I have a little kid one day, am I their father? Can they call me that? Can they call me dad? Yes, but I am still in Christ their equal. I still would technically be their brother in Christ. And I think that's the distinction that we need to make. Because yes, we have different roles. In the church, we all have different roles. In life, we have different roles. Like again, if we had a kid, like if we had a kid, as a parent, we would have authority over that kid. We would have an authoritative role. The board of this church who makes our decisions here, they have an authority over what happens with this church that other people don't necessarily have, right? So there are different roles, 
There are different authorities on earth. But when it comes to the spiritual, when it comes down to our souls in Christ, we are equal. And Paul says that in Galatians 3, in the context of, that, of salvation. He says there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. You are all one in Christ. So when it comes to being in Christ, we are equal. So you can call me pastor, I mean, but you don't have to. A problem would be if in my heart I was like, ah, oh, yeah, I'm a pastor. I'm so much better than everyone else. That's horrible, right? That's awful. That'd be terrible. Also, it would be bad if I demanded to be called pastor. Because sometimes people like to correct you if you don't use their correct title, right? Like, if you were to come up to me and say, oh, hey, John. And I'd be like, hey, that's Pastor John to you, right? <laughs> that would not be great. I don't want to do that. That should never happen. You, you shouldn't be demanding to be called by your title just because God put you in a leadership role. You may be a leader of a congregation, but in Christ, you are equal to your congregation. So this is what I would say about this. I would say, if you're a leader and you feel that your title is something that elevates you above others, then don't be called by that title. Right? If you're a leader and you feel that your title is something that elevates you above others, then don't be called by that title. And if you are someone who calls your leader by a certain title, but you feel like calling them that elevates them above you, then don't call them by that title. Right? This is not a passage that's all about, oh, you can never use the word father unless it's for God the Father. No, and we even see Paul in his letters during certain uh, places. He calls himself teacher, and he even calls himself a father in Christ. And that's not to elevate himself as more than an equal in Christ, but it's just to show that people can learn and have been learning from him like a son might be learning from a father. Paul's the last person to elevate himself in Christ. He even feels like he's the least of all the saints. This isn't about never using the word rabbi or father or leader. It's about not using those words to elevate yourself, right? It's about not using them to think that you're better than anyone else or to show, to try and prove that you're better than anyone else. Because the truth is you are not better than anyone else in the eyes of God. You're not. Now, are there better pastors than other pastors? Yeah, are there better preachers than others, right? Yeah, we kind of know that. There are better ones. It's just like how you can think of a bunch of other things. Better bank robbers than other people. Better poker players than other people. Better singers, right? Is Russ a better guitar player than I am? Yeah, absolutely he is, right? I don't even know how to play guitar. But that's not what we're talking about here, right? We're talking about spiritually, in the eyes of God, we are better than no one. What's the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian, right? Is a Christian better than a non-Christian? No. Jesus is better. That's the only difference, is that Jesus is better and that we have him in us. That makes us no better than them. It just means Jesus is better because our own righteousness, it's filthy rags. It's absolutely filthy rags, just like the righteousness of everyone else. We are no more deserving of going to heaven than anyone else. The only thing that saved us at all was God's grace because we placed our faith in Christ and his lordship, in his death, and in his resurrection. No works of our own got us anywhere. No works of our own got us anywhere. So we are better than no one. We are equal when it comes to our own standing before God. The only thing that changes whether or not God accepts us or not is Christ. It's not us. We're all equally bad. The next thing Jesus does is he goes straight into talking about humility in verse 11. The greatest among you shall be your servant. 
Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Humility is the way to go. When you do something wrong, or you do something that's against what you have just said, don't try and justify it. Don't try and justify it. Admit you're wrong. When you're given a position of authority, don't think of yourself as better than others. You're not. Christ is the one who's better. Your earthly title does nothing when it comes to salvation. Jesus saves. And when you come to him, don't come boasting in your works. That's a recipe for rejection. No, come to him humbly, knowing that there's nothing you can do about your own sin, but knowing that Christ can do something about it. And if that's the kind of humility that you come with, a humility that submits to Jesus as Lord and believes in his saving work of dying on the cross for your sin and rising from the dead, then you will be exalted, right? Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. And also remember that even when you are saved from hell, even when you are forgiven of your sin, even though you are secure in the hands of God that no one can snatch you from and you know that you will be exalted to heaven, remember even now to stay humble. Jesus says, the greatest among you shall be your servant. The greatest among you shall be your servant. If you have a high title and you can't get down and serve the least of these, then you don't deserve that title. Unless the title is like hypocrite or prideful or not great because the greatest serve. The greatest serve. You want to know about the one with the most titles, the highest titles, right? The one that they call the great I am, the one that they call wonderful, counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace, the alpha and the omega, right? The beginning and the end, the creator of all things, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, God almighty. You know what he did with all those titles? He served us. He served us sinners by coming to earth, living a human life filled with temptations, but never giving in. He washed some really gross disciple feet and he became a curse, scourged, beaten, nailed to a tree, nailed to the cross to save really the scum of the earth. Your titles are nothing compared to his. And he served the absolute least of these. So there's really no excuse for us not to serve. Bow with me in prayer. Lord, you are so good. And it's amazing just to think of how high you are and how low you you came to save us. Your love for us is so amazing. Instead of holding that bitterness in your heart when we originally sinned, when Adam sinned in the garden and just leaving us and never having anything to do with Adam or or any of his descendants or anything like that, instead, you provided a sacrifice for Adam. You had mercy on, on so many people throughout the Old Testament. And then you provided a sacrifice for the whole world. And that was you yourself. It's amazing that not only did you not turn your back on us, that you came and became so lowly for our sake. It's amazing, Lord. Thank you so much. And just help us to abide by your word. Help us to not feel like we're above anyone else. Help us to remember that you're the one who is good. You're the one who is above. And help that to really affect the way we live as we serve others, no matter who they may be.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much. And, yeah. Also, just help us not to, not to be hypocritical. Help us to kind of, and I know, I know sometimes we just don't even know that we've gone against what we've said and we just forget stuff. But just help us to recognize when we are wrong and just really be with us in that. Um, we want to look up to you as our example. And I know there's many good examples. Paul is, of course, a great example. He says, be imitators of me as I imitate Christ. And so there's others that we can look to to imitate, but let you be our greatest example, Lord. We want to live with the love that you, you have. We want to care for people with the love that you have or the care that you have for people. And so just help us to do those things and help us to be a people of our word. Thank you, Lord. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.